have Beverly Chase and J.P. Olson, uh, who are both from Vice HBO. Um, and like I said, Beverly was the supervising producer and you are director of programming. Um, what an incredible piece. I, I, the first question that comes to mind for me is how you found these amazing families and, and children and parents. I mean, talk a little bit about yeah. that process. Um, the, the film was produced by a wonderful producer, Nicole um, Bazorgmir, and she and Gianna, and their AP, um, Hendrik Hinzel, spent uh, a lot of time online scouring the internet, talking to uh, the doctors, trying to find the best possible um, characters for the film that would be sort of your everyday average people that could be your neighbor or your um, your best friend or your, you know, your next door neighbor's kid and they wanted to really find people that everyone could relate to um, and I think that they did a great job of sort of curating an a, amazing group of I, I agree. Do you want to? Uh, well, my role uh, at HBO is to oversee the program so by the time it gets to me um, <laughs> By the time it gets to me, a lot of the, the uh, really, ultimately, all, all of the heavy lifting has been done. I would generally know what the stories are going to be. I was obviously extremely excited when I heard that this was going to be the subject coming up. And when I saw the film, I was absolutely positively knocked out by it. Uh, but clearly, uh, really, really a lot of care with uh, the reporting and the casting. Mm -hmm. And as I'm sure you all noticed, just a very graceful narrative arc in terms of the age that tells the 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 growth story and also the ethical medical story along the way. It's just a beautifully constructed piece of work in my humble opinion. So. I would completely agree. And, and I think for people who are sort of um, either uninitiated or confused about what it means to be transgender or mm -hmm. transgender youth in particular, I think this is a beautiful way to sort of expose them to, as you said, yeah. these are us. These are everyday people. There is what's extraordinary is their ability to sort of live their lives um, in an environment that may not mm -hmm. be um, open to who they're trying to be. And that yeah. I was really struck by that with your first story. You know that them, and and that's one of the things I wanted to just ask mm -hmm. a little bit about as well is that, you know, we sort of are coming into the story at a point um, where I think a lot of changes have already happened in these families in terms mm -hmm. of what they've come to terms with. And so I'm kind of yeah. curious about that decision, you know, that you decided to pick up the story when they, like parents have already processed how they feel about things. Yeah. Can you speak to that a little bit? I mean, I don't get the sense that uh, the parents in the film are all completely finished processing everything that's going on. Right. Um, and I think that's part of what's really interesting about it is that at each stage there's something new to process that they, um, don't really know. It's sort of uncharted territory for all of them. Um, but uh, yeah, we, I, I don't know how um, easy it would be to find people willing to talk about, you know, not being at all supportive of their kids. I don't think that those are people that want documentaries. That's to be made about them. <laughs> That's a good um, point. That's so a really I good think, point. I don't know if they came across a lot of that, you know, um, you know, Nicole, uh, the producer, and Gianna would be, and Hendrik, better people to speak on, you know, how, w you know, if they were coming to grips between, you know, deciding between, you know, non-supportive family versus supportive family. But I think Charlotte is the perfect example, who's the, you know, the last character in the film um, of that, that exact thing, you know. She doesn't have a family that's willing to support her and talk about her situation, so. Right, and I agree with what you were saying in terms of the story arc. Rather than starting with her story, ending with her story, we really can put it in this different context of like, if she had those parents around her who were able to sort of mm -hmm. embrace who she was differently. Right. That she, and she was aware of that. She might have a different outcome, but. And you even described when we talked before that you really see this as a film about love. Which, I do, yeah, yeah if you I do. you to speak to that a little bit. Well, I think it's, um, yeah, it's very moving because it's uh, an example of a family that will accept uh, a child for who they are, you know, and that's uh, being a father. You know, it's, uh, it touches a deep, uh, a deep thing, I think, in anyone that has children, anyone that uh, cares about uh, people who are uh, vulnerable. So, mm -hmm. um, so I do, I see it as a love story, I see it as a, um, you know, an example of 
families who are really trying to accept uh, their child as their child is in the face of you know really um, not just uh, uh, not just local uh, or neighborhood opposition, but at this point federal governmental opposition. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's a, obviously the timing of this is. Uh, extraordinary from our perspective because this film was worked on as as Beverly would say is about a year so the fact that it happened at this point um, with uh, with the uh, with the recent um, you know discussions it's uh, it was a, a great opportunity to be able to bring this subject in front of people in a in a way that has a human face to it and I'm sure it's very deliberate but you know the fact that the stories that you were telling were very intimate and very much about, like you said, the love that these parents are showing for their children and vice versa. And then you cut to these news stories. Like you said, you jump to the national mm -hmm. stories surrounding these and you see just what a different uh, a difference it feels to sort of put those two ideas next to each other. Can you just talk a little about that in terms of the sort of the editorial decisions around that? Yeah, I mean, I think that people um, are so focused, people that aren't really close to this story, are so focused on this debate about bathrooms and a lot of people just don't understand like why are they fighting about bathrooms and I think the important thing for us to get across was that it's so much more than bathrooms but we couldn't not acknowledge the fact that that is you know what everybody's talking about right now and we wanted to see like yes there's you know this may or may not seem like a small thing to somebody but these are the issues that um, these people are grappling with and it's about so much more than that um, that the fact that they get this extra kind of slap in the face by not being able to use the bathroom, mm -hmm. you know, it's just like, you know, why? Yeah, and there's a there's a practical aspect to this too. Um, you know, if a child's five or six or seven years old and they're not necessarily uh, given the opportunity to go to a bathroom where they're comfortable, they may well go to the bathroom, you know, in, in their pants and their whatever they're wearing, and that's not a small thing as a kid. That's a traumatic, you know, event for a kid. So I think that that's easily kind of pushed out of the way, but um, you know, there's certainly examples I'm sure that you could find quite easily if you were to ask parents who are dealing with this who uh, their children are, you know, either can't go to the bathroom at school, don't feel comfortable, feel, uh, you know, feel intimidated or even bullied because of this. It's like, it's a real thing, you know, it seems, you know, like one part of it, but depending on the age of the child, it could have a really strong uh, repercussion. And in fact, there's, Interesting, it was a Vice News Tonight story was all about um, uh, doing laundry for kids at the local school and they found that the rates of the kids returning to class was much higher because kids were ashamed of the mm. clothing mm. they were wearing because it was dirty. So those are, you know, they seem like, um, you know, they seem like the sort of thing that sort of, oh, well, people get over it. Well, maybe not so much. I mean, you're mm -hmm. talking about little kids here, you know. I think that's a really good point. And the other thing that I'm sort of struck by, especially around the bathroom issue, is mm -hmm. turning children into predators. That somehow, yeah. you know, a five-year-old... Yeah. With, no, <laughs> with no evidence of any kind. With no yeah. evidence of any kind who needs, like you said, who needs to use a bathroom, and you're right, these are traumatic things for young children, has now, ha has now, is now sort of being labeled as this aggressor or this predator. Mm -hmm. I, it just, I felt like you're, the, the mom that spoke, Kai's mom that mm -hmm. spoke at that school board meeting, did a great job of sort of putting that issue in the larger context. So, yeah. I mean, that was a great choice. I think you guys part to sort oh, of, thank you. yeah. Um, I was curious about um, Gianna because she seems, and this was something, you know, this must be, I think, particular to Vice, the way that you do things. She felt very much a part of the story. Now, um, talk a little bit about that, you know, that she wasn't just, at one point toward the end, she tears up. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Did I notice that? She did tear yeah. up in that. Yeah, she was very connected to these families as well, and she's a producer on the show also. Um, and uh, she's just wonderful with them. I think the idea is that, you know, we want to immerse the audience into the story. So it, we want it to, see, to seem like you're there talking to these people. And, you know, Gianna isn't there to necessarily be a part of the story herself, but she wants to put you in the perspective of you know, living with these characters and being, in, you know, a part of the story in that way. So it's not just her standing in front of, you know, like any other news reporter with the report, you know, happening behind her. She is part of the story to get to get you closer to, you know, the inside of what's going on. Uh, did you want to speak to that as well? Well, I think the, you know, the, the, the style, as we were kind of discussing a bit earlier, the style of Vice from the early days is very much out of an alternative newspaper 
perspective, immersive, uh, having a point of view, uh, but a point of view that you can back up with, with facts or at least a reasonable assembly of what people could agree, yes, this is what happened or this is how that person feels or doesn't feel. Um, yeah, I think the use of a correspondent, I, I, you know, I, I am regularly struck, uh, personally, and it's my own bias, but I'm regularly struck by how Vice has moved the, um, the role of the correspondent into a much different space in the way that we tell stories now. Um, I, I'm fine with, with conventional news reporting. Um, not every piece uh, of journalism necessarily has to have an advocacy perspective, but I think there is something to be said for you look at a lot of the way that news is reported now and you compare it to the way the correspondents are used in vice pieces and they do seem um, in a certain sense a, a bit retrograde in my in my opinion. Mm -hmm. You're think. talking about the other news? Uh, I think just in general the, the, the style and sensibility that Vice has introduced has really shifted the way that people deal with correspondence and things that would have been considered uh, far too immersive into the story I think are now being seen as potentially ways to tell a story that are totally legitimate that would have been suppressed previously, if that makes sense. It makes total sense, and I, I agree. I mean, I, I have to say that I was, I, I really enjoyed her role in the piece. Mm -hmm. And I, I was thinking that if she wasn't in this role the way she was, um, I don't know that the piece would have been quite as effective, because she, like you said, mm -hmm. she really was us. Right. You know, and she had a beautiful way of interacting both with the um, children, mm -hmm. which is not an easy thing to do, as we all know, mm -hmm. and with the parents. So, and but it was I, I was aware of it. I was aware that there were times when you had a, a reaction shot of her in a scene. Um, I think it was some of the medical scenes mm -hmm. when she was sitting in the room with yeah. the family, and rather than cutting to a family member, you cut to her at one point. Yeah. And I, I was that to me was an interesting choice. Can you mm -hmm. just talk a little bit about that? Um, well, first of all, I want to say that the editor of the piece is here. Who is in the audience, and Paula. And she's the, one of our best Where editors you, on the show, Paula. Um, I didn't see you, but she did a fantastic job of, you know, incorporating this whole story together. Um, but, you know, the choice to include Gianna in these, these scenes is, is exactly, you know, sort of what we've been talking about. Um, and Gianna is wonderful at asking those questions that you would be asking if you were sitting right there. Um, and I think that all of our correspondents are really good about sort of doing that and playing the role of, you know, what the average person would be, um, you know, just curious about and naturally want to know. And I'll, I'll say this. I thought she really walked that line. I never felt like it was about her mm -hmm. because I, and you can talk to this yeah. a little bit. I think there's a real danger. Mm -hmm. when the correspondent or the filmmaker so ins insinuates himself yeah. into the story that you start to lose the story. And I don't think that happened here. But talk about the, your awareness of that and how you have to make choices around that. I mean, I think that there's definitely like a fly on the wall aspect of, you know, uh, a lot of those scenes in terms of when she's in the doctor's appointments and that sort of thing. Um, but when they're doing an interview, like a sit down interview, her presence being so grounded and normal. It's not, she's said this herself is, you know, you're not sitting across from somebody wearing like a $5,000 dress with their hair and makeup all done to do some interview. Um, you know, she's just a normal person and it brings out this quality in the characters that I don't think you can get at in any other way. She just makes them so comfortable and that I think you know, is one of her strengths. And it, it's clear. And yeah. I was thinking the same thing when I first saw her, and mm -hmm. it was like, oh, she's wearing that outfit throughout the whole <laughs> yeah. film pretty much. And I thought, yeah. good for her, you know, that, that she was really being herself. Yeah, which I'm they're sure really, never made up. Yeah. They don't care. They're just yeah. there. They're along for the ride, yeah, and it's, it's, a, it's amazing. A, it's a very deliberate, mm -hmm. obviously, on your part. But I think you're absolutely right. It sort of changes how you feel about who the correspondent is and what their role is. Yeah, I mean, I think that it's, again, I mean, I came up in the, in the news business of, you know, of the see-all, know-all sort of either correspondent or anchor person, and, and there's a place for that, but it's not the only way to tell a story, and it's, it's refreshing. I mean, part of what we've seen, obviously, with this explosion in uh, television programming is this ability uh, to tell stories in a way that would not have been conceivable when you had the big three. Um, I'm reminded there's, this is probably not a 
company that anyone would know, but when I was first starting out, I was obsessed with this British company uh, called Journeyman that did beautiful documentaries all around the world and very similar to Vice, but made you know at a time when they couldn't do what Vice was doing exactly um, in terms of the aesthetics, but the there was very little um, there was very little care about the correspondent other than this is a reporter and uh, and and I remember at that point when I would see these documentaries in one case I remember there was this incredibly well done piece about um, uh, basically persecution of Christians in Sudan and it was an extraordinary story uh, and I remember thinking there's no way at the time I was working at ABC News uh, I thought there's just no way that we would ever do that story who will ever do that story I don't know how many people actually saw those documentaries but Vice now has this I think it's a really important powerful time uh, in terms of the kind of storytelling that the Vice is doing and that HBO is supporting is the sense that you have this ability to go around the world, tell stories that people aren't talking about necessarily, tell them in a way that's not conventional, uh, do it in a way that's real. And uh, that's, not, that's not easy, that's not often easily funded. And it's hard, and I mean, I think the headline to me for, for anything is that, uh, that, that, that uh, Vice is working on, it's hard to make anything that's good. It's very hard. And so just to do that it, it is, an, is an accomplishment, and then to get it in front of a number of people, thank you, uh, uh, a number of people who will then take that and, uh, and pass that on is a real, uh, to me, a rare opportunity, one that I get up truly every morning thinking, like, I'm ready to start the day because I'm on a mission with Vice to make sure that this great work gets seen by people because it's important. And it's a, I, I've, I've been around the block enough to know that it's a, it's a rare opportunity to have the combination of distribution, resources, and a really talented group of people who are doing such good work. It's just like, you know, I mean, fingers crossed it'll keep going, you know. I, I hope so, yeah. I mean, I, I, I was thinking that. I was thinking <laughs> that, you know, this is a story that, um, I mean, with HBO, you've got a platform now that you hope a larger audience gets to see it. And I want to just talk about that a little bit. What, do you, what are your hopes for this in terms of who sees it, um, what kind of voice is it going to put out there? Talk a little bit yeah, about that. Tomor tomorrow we're releasing this film because obviously not everyone has HBO and that's okay, but um, we'll have, the, um, uh, we'll have uh, the link for this film will be released on YouTube tomorrow at 10.30. So obviously if anyone is interested, if you look under trans youth and HBO and Vice, you should be able to find it and uh, take that link and share it with your friends. Um, when we have an opportunity, to, to use uh, a, a, a project or a program like this for some kind of public good, we get behind that and we try to support it so people can see it uh, who aren't necessarily uh, subscribers. And do you have community outreach around the? Do we you, do actually. Do you do yeah. that with yes, your films? Yes, and this, yeah, and in fact, this um, this particular film is being supported uh, by an organization called P Flag, which has uh, um, has uh, uh, 400 chapters around the country. Um, so we're really trying, I guess, in a sense, hotwire the system to make sure that anyone who wants to see this film uh, will have an opportunity to do so and there won't be any barrier to that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's, uh, you know, truthfully, there's not a lot of times in one's life where you're like, this is a great thing, we spend a lot of time and care on it, and here it is for free. And so, you know, in, in, in the cases like this where we really feel strongly as a company, and I know Vice mm -hmm. does a, as well, to make sure that people can get this, we, we, we do what we can. So what about people that um, don't think they want to see this film? How do you, um, if, does that make sense? You know what I'm getting at there? I, I think yeah. about sort of the school board superintendent, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, or I think about maybe people in our current administration. I feel like there's people that if they were to see this film, you know, there's, there's a way that you tell the story that I think they, they could sit and listen to it, and they wouldn't sort of put their blinders up. But just talk a little bit about that. How do you get to... Yeah, boy. I mean, I don't think you can change a person's heart. I mean, that's yeah. going to be what it is. Um, I like to think there are enough people out there who are open-minded enough who would see that and think, you know what, this, I just learned something, which is the point of this is why we do this. Yeah, right. That's why. You know, right. It's, it's, it's an interest in engaging in some aspect of the world that, we, you know, that we're interested in. Um, but I think, uh, you know, again, I don't think you can change a person's heart, but to me, watching a film like this, among other things, I think any reasonable person would walk away thinking, well, if I had a child, this would no longer be an abstraction. This would be what it is. And I think for that 
alone, I think that it has a real opportunity to at least get people uh, who are open-minded and trying to understand something in a sincere way uh, to think about it with a little more uh, with a little more depth and a little more empathy. Mm -hmm. Empathy, yeah. I think, yeah. yeah. So one of the things that's inter interesting to me is that our flyer that we put up, mm -hmm. the image that we have on our flyer, <laughs> mm -hmm. and the piece that we just watched tonight. Yes. Put, tell yeah. me how those two go together in I the same. In, I was in the meeting for That's that. That's a really good <laughs> question. Okay, so talk to me because I was really struck by that. Yeah, well, you know, uh, well, the, the, the image is what we call key art, and you get one shot at it. So in general, the feeling is that you need to, to do something bold, and we tried a number of different, uh, different approaches. We're talking about the, the I'm talking season. about the one with all yeah, the, with yeah. the guns. Um, yes. We, we, looked, we looked at, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I, we all raised that question, um, but the decision was that the image said a lot of what uh, Vice does, which is to get inside a potentially uh, dangerous situation and see it from the inside. And that was sort of the rationale visually. Now I know someone else could, could interpret something very differently, and, uh, and I wouldn't begrudge that, but that was certainly the, the way that, uh, that we were looking at it when we were doing the key art was this. When so, you say inter interpret it differently, how would they interpret it differently? Well, I mean, I think we're talking about the, it's the gun image, The gun correct? image, yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, it's, I mean, we're in Chicago, you know, we're in New York Got City. It. I mean, it's like that's, yeah. you know, guns are saying. killing people all over the place. So yeah. it was it was something that we, you know, that we had talked about uh, when we were putting it out. But I think the general idea f f as far as promoting the show uh, through that single image is to get the one that has the most impact. And in fact, we tried a number of different things that were, um, like sort of Rashomon tiled, oh, right. you know, we tried a number of different things, but every time we looked at it, we went, you know, that's the one that actually says something about, okay, this is a program that deals with intense issues and that has like a real sort of ferocity to, right. to it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a good question. Yeah, because you know, I, I, about, I really was last struck Last season by it that. was a guy on fire. I'm yeah. sorry? Last year it was a, a man on fire. Well, actually it was right. a man running away. Running the fire away. was behind right. him. Right. But so, you know, obviously you still need to advertise, is what you're saying here, and you still yeah. need to draw an audience to you, which is everyone has to yeah. do that. Mm -hmm. And you have to make some choices. But I was particularly struck by mm -hmm. that poster and the, the piece yeah. that we saw today. Yeah. Which well, also goes to, which is, I want to ask you both, mm -hmm. and maybe you in particular, you know, just historically what people think vice is. Mm -hmm. And sort of talking about what it started started as and what it means to be vice on HBO mm -hmm. and kind of what's that what what was the transformation there in terms of the well the I mean I can give you the sort of if you brief, don't of course the sort of brief journey of vice which I'm not an expert but actually prior to uh, working for HBO I did write and do uh, some uh, investigative uh, reporting for vice so I was familiar with some of the people um, at the organization before that but the um, um, it started as an alternative newspaper uh, in the 1990s, I believe 1994, and um, as it went through time, it started off, I think, with a kind of almost, uh, this is for a much older audience, but almost like a merry prankster-ish kind of perspective, a glint in the eye, and, and clearly thumbing its nose at, at the establishment, as any good alternative newspaper <laughs> is compelled to do and should do. Um, and I think just as time's gone, it's 20 years now, it, it's, it's evolved into a much larger en endeavor. I think at one point in time, it was three, you know, very much dudes living in a, <laughs> in, a, in, a, in a flat in Montreal trying to figure out whether they could put out a, a newspaper and it's evolved to one of the bigger media organizations that I'm aware of and certainly one that takes up a lot of the, the, the public uh, attention with the, with the work that it's doing. Um, obviously, um, you know, it started as a print magazine and then as, it gone, as it's gone more and more into video, it's just expanding and expanding and expanding. So I guess the short version is Shane Smith, who's the founder of of Vice has said he wants to be he wants Vice to be the Time Warner of the street, and that is very much what it is. So you have, you know, this might be for one audience, this might be for another. And in my estimation, the HBO, both Vice News Tonight and the documentary series, they're really aimed at uh, I think an audience that wants to know about the world around them. Um, they don't necessarily want to know uh, the, the opinion of pundits. Uh, they want to know what someone is thinking who may not be in the public eye all the time. Um, it's almost an anti-celebrity approach to the news. Um, I, you know, I think that the, the Vice is many things to many people. Right. One of the things I, I was struck by again with this piece is there was a calm to it. And the reason I say that is because I feel like 
we're in an age right now where we feel like the only way we can get information sometimes is that it has to be sort of screamed at us and we're things are yeah. just being you know what I mean mm -hmm. and I, I was I was struck by the fact that you were sort of saying we're gonna tell you the story and then you can sit and listen to it we're not gonna scream the story at you and we're not gonna like slam the story at you which also again s struck me as interesting when I think about vice historically mm -hmm. and some of the other yeah. pieces of vice has done so I, I, I agree I, th I think we're seeing a range mm. here um, but again I liked the calm and if you can just talk about that I mean I think we should talk a little bit about the the world that this piece now sits in because mm -hmm. obviously things have changed dramatically I don't know if they have or they haven't but the language around media has changed a lot in the last couple of months whether the actual media has yeah. changed mm. or it hasn't changed the language around it has changed and so just talk about that in terms of like where you see your work sitting in the world of documentary today in the world of journalism and media today because you know a lot of things are being thrown around in terms yeah. of like fake news and and the the bad media you know yeah. just it's it's I mean, I'll just do it with a quip. I mean, I woke up one morning and I realized I was an enemy of the people. There you go. Yeah. Which was a surprise to me. Yeah. You know, considering, I mean, Be Beverly as well. I mean, we've spent much of our adult lives trying to do good work and bring stories to people that uh, have import and are fact-checked and are as accurate. I mean, a good reporter, which the people at Vice are all very good reporters, stay up at night wondering, did I get that right? Mm -hmm. That's what goes on in the mind of a journalist. I don't know if most people recognize that, but anyone that's actually practiced journalism for more than a minute will quickly see that if you get something wrong, you'll get a phone call or, you know, there, there are consequences to it. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think it's a very hostile environment yeah. uh, for, for media, but it's also in a lot of ways, I, th I think we're probably in line with what Watergate was because every day there's a new story. And again, I, you, it's hard not to get up every morning and think like, what's this next day going to bring? It's an extraordinary time. Uh, in that way, and, I, and I, I have a very strong feeling about the show personally uh, from that perspective. Again, there's a rare opportunity to be able to do this kind of work, get it funded, get it seen, uh, and be supported. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, he hit the nail on the head too in terms of, um, you know, feeling like the enemy when the passion that we all bring to this job in terms of getting these stories out to people is it's mind-blowing. I mean, the amount of sleep we lose over these stories and wanting to do justice to the characters and make sure that their voices are, um, you know, put out into the world in the best possible way and then to hear, you know, that yeah. sort of response is heartbreaking, you yeah. know, and we, um, you know, we do care so much about the integrity of our show and, uh, Talk a little bit about that because I, I I sensed it in your piece yeah. and I sensed it in talking to both of you. But 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 tell me what that means like to to maintain integrity around the work that you do. I, I think people don't. I think it would be great for us to just get a gl little glimpse of like what that means. It's like what you decide to leave out, how you decide to say things. Oh. Is, does that make sense? What I'm trying That's to a ask here. Yeah. I I, guess, I just think it's really important because you, like you said, you both care so much. Yeah. And I'm sure that it's all about details and making sure that things mm -hmm. are right. But it's also about making some choices about what you decide yeah. is the piece. And That's, just just talk about that in terms of this realm of integrity, if you the, can. It's probably the hardest part of my job on a daily basis is, you know, we're, we're, we have a clock. You know, we don't have the luxury of really making whatever length movie we want to make. You know, I am in theory, supposed to deliver a, a show that is 29 minutes and 30 seconds for the most part. Um, and that doesn't leave a lot of wiggle room. And you know, most of our episodes are two segments. So uh, Trans Kids is pretty rare for us to do a full 30 minute episode on one topic. But normally we have about 14 to 16 minutes for a given you know topic and the two are paired together. Um, and the way our process works is we don't initially know which two segments are going to be paired together and which stories are going to be paired. So once we sort of kind of late in the game decide on what we call a, a stack is going to be, my, part of my job is to get that stack to time. And that means that take, taking something that's been so carefully crafted over you know, a short period of time to you know the word, and now I'm the one who is like, okay, we need to lose 30 seconds of this and 25 seconds of that, right. um, and to do that and maintain the integrity and not lose um, the real meaning. Know. Yeah, the real meaning I, of what they're saying is yeah. is 
it's a heartbreak to me. So basically for my process is, um, because I'm not as close to the stories in terms of like the details as some of the producers, um, I make basically a list of all of the things that I would potentially cut out. Um, and then I sit with the producer and the editor of the piece and I say, you know, is there a specific reason that you have this detail in here? Because I may drop it. And a lot of times they'll come back and say, yes, that detail is, you know, very important to this, you know, piece of the puzzle. And, you know, I'm like, okay, well, let's move on to this one. And, you know, I'm always forced to find more cuts than I need so that I can sort of, there's a give and take in there. And um, I don't want to end up, you know, gutting these pieces at the end just for the sake of time. Right. Um, but, you know, that's sort of the nature of the job. But, you know, the idea of, checking with the people who have been living with the stories because I'm dealing with 60 stories, you know, in a season, they basically have four or five, so they're so much more in tune with the, you know, tiny little details that the, may seem like nothing to me. Um, so I go over every single one with them. Right, because you could pull out a yeah. detail that could change the intent. Right, and exactly. You, and you're saying you're very careful about yes. not doing that. Yes. And, did you want to talk to that, about that a little bit? Because you, you even shared a, a conversation about that, that you watched a piece at one point, not a vice piece. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think it's important what you leave in, what you leave in, uh, what, what you take out, obviously. Um, there was an example um, of, a, of a film that was dealing with a, um, a person who wasn't getting health care um, because, um, and it was a domestic partnership, um, uh, two women in, um, I think, in New Jersey, but the um, the partner wasn't getting uh, insurance um, because of the nature of their relationship, and the person had cancer. The person was also a smoker, which is whatever. That's what's happened, but the um, but it was never discussed. It was never revealed in the film, and I thought, well, I don't know if that's necessarily like that. Wouldn't be something that I would necessarily be comfortable with because I think you can both be a smoker and it could still be a sympathetic story, but you need to embrace certain facts that are apparent. Because I think by avoiding that, you run the risk of, of basically saying, well, I don't think that, uh, you know, basically you're, you're trying to cook the narrative in a way. And that's, that's, you know, people have different standards for these things. Right. I don't think if I, I don't necessarily even know if that's wrong what I mentioned, but I know that I wouldn't be comfortable with that because I came up out of a journalism background. And it's basically if you're, if you're incorporating certain facts and ideas, you're doing them because you're trying to build an accurate and coherent narrative about a story that ultimately leads you to some deeper understanding. And if you leave one of those elements out that could further inform this larger understanding, it's not quite a fair takeaway for the person. Again, you know, documentary is slippery. I, it's very for slippery. sure. I mean, I think mm -hmm. Vice is a much more journalistic endeavor than people might realize, knowing yeah. what the I, I yeah. think you're absolutely right. I think right. a lot of people assume that we're sort of manipulating things in the edit and changing the story, and it's it's absolutely not yeah. the case in any way. And we're really careful too. So why do you think that perception is out there about Vice? Because I, I I would agree with you. I don't think it's true. I don't know I that it's Vice specific. I think that that's a, a larger <laughs> conversation that's been happening across all sort of ah, media okay. outlets. You know, there was a, you know. I'm not gonna go into yeah, detail. Yeah, I mean, I think like I mean, yeah, you don't want to name. I'm names. not gonna name names, yeah. but yeah, I, there's there, it's happened. we're being recorded. Yeah, you know, <laughs> and, and, and I think Vice is the new the new kid on the block, and so there's that as well, and it's taken up a fair amount of oxygen in other places, and and that's fair, and you know people want to come at the at the at the entity because either they you know they don't like what it stands for, you know, politically or in terms of the way that it's being reported, or they feel like it's too, um, uh, you know, it's too uh, energetic in its, in its style or something. You know, there's a million ways to look at it. But I'm coming, you know, I came, again, I've said it a million times, I started as a daily newspaper reporter. I worked for Peter Jennings. I worked on Frontline. I worked uh, on documentaries for the New York Times. Like, I understand what it means to be accurate in the reporting. And, and in, that was a large part, I believe, why I was hired initially to help work on Vice within HBO because it's largely an entertainment mm -hmm. company and they needed a person out of journalism background who understood nightly news but also works in documentary and actually made stuff and understands what what's involved with that because it's not a small thing. It's easy, as we all know, 
uh, to just tear something down. It's much more difficult to build something up or to make something right. so much easier. Right. You know. Mm -hmm. So I think part of it is is that. I think that's you know, and I do it as well. Yeah. When I watch Shark Tank. Yeah, exactly. Uh -huh. I was just gonna say the same thing. It's like it's yeah. little, it's really yeah. easy when you watch something you go ah, you know, you start ripping yeah. it apart as opposed to like well wait a minute, mm -hmm. what is it I'm watching and and yeah. Um, well, I have to say that um, I, th I I just feel like this piece was a great piece for you to show for oh, us great. tonight. I really, I mean, it gave me a very different impression mm -hmm. of the kind of work you do, I'll, I'll admit. I had a little bit of that prejudice <laughs> myself. It also, for me, was, um, and I don't know about how the audience felt about this, but I really enjoyed, and I don't often, but I really enjoyed your, um, you know, Gianna in the piece. Mm -hmm. I really found myself sort of being okay about that because that is one of those things. We all have those things that we sort of bristle at if we've been doing this work yeah. for a long time. And one of those is when I feel like someone's insinuated themselves too much and I felt like, boy, she really walked that line beautifully mm -hmm. and you, the piece walked the line beautifully, yeah. so. Yeah, and I think, I have to say, uh, I think the correspondence in Vice across the board are really quite extraordinary because um, uh, it's not quite the same, but a friend of mine, uh, it was actually, well, it's a long story, but a, a reporter that I'd started out with way back in my first job is Glenn Thrush, who's now covering the White House for the New York Times. Right. Glenn, and I, Glenn and I were reporters together, and I remember he liked this one reporter, reporter's style. He said, he's got the million dollar common touch. And I thought, <laughs> well, that's interesting. And in the same sense, I think the vice correspondents have this certain kind of ability to be in a situation to appear real, cool, but also invested and serious about what they're doing in a way that's, you know, that's not easy. That's no. a real, mm -hmm. true that's a real skill. talent and it's also yes. unpredictable because you could take a person who has some training in journalism and they'd be a total natural and they'd take to it quickly and you could take someone else who could go through a FOIA document like nobody's business and you could take them yep. to drama camp and it's, it's just not going to matter. And I know that Bever, uh, Beverly has a lot more of insight into that, but it's a, that's, a very, um, that's a very difficult thing to find in itself. And there's so many components to how these things come together properly. You know, you have Shane Smith starting a, a fanzine way, a magazine way back then, leading up to all like what you have now, which is an incredible architecture of work that's going on that has all these components, has verite style, has some of the best shooting that you'll see mm -hmm. in, on television. Mm -hmm. It has really Absolutely. good writing, which by the way, writing for television is definitely like writing with a 500 pound pencil. It's incredibly difficult. It's incredibly difficult to be concise and elegant in the writing, Absolutely. very difficult to do. Right. Uh, and then again, the story selection, you know, and the, and the willingness to go out and engage in stories that uh, other people either aren't thinking of or don't have the opportunity to do or just don't, you know, don't necessarily, uh, you know, don't necessarily see the value in them, but they should. You know? Right. So I just I, we're going to take questions from the audience in just a little bit, but I just wanted to ask um, some of your other pieces, though, where your correspondents are literally, you know, standing next to something blowing up mm -hmm. or um, talking, you know, in the middle of a cartel. Um, in terms of those situations. Mm -hmm. You know what are the what are the limits? What do, what are the what are the things that you say to them? Um, I mean, do they have any limits on themselves? Talk a little bit Gosh. about that. I mean, that's sort of the other side of some of the stories I mean, you I do. Have my, I want to hear what Beverly has. I oh, have my gosh. take, but I want to hear yeah. your take. Yeah, um, I don't know what the limits really are. I mean, I think obviously we don't want anybody to get hurt or be in danger, and I think you know we're very careful with security in situations where we think people are going to be. In, dangerous situations and there's a lot of conversations that mm -hmm. go on um, before anybody does anything that puts them at risk of anything, any sort. Um, but, you know, I haven't, I've only been at Vice for a year and a half, but there hasn't been a situation um, that I've been in where we're like, nope, it's not happening. Really? I mean, there, there were, we've come close. There have definitely been some tense conversations about should they take this road or do this and yeah. um, and and you know in an episode that's coming up there was a lot of conversation about whether or not Gianna um, should should take this one route and it was extremely dangerous and I think it came back that it was absolutely no in no way should she do that and okay I'm then glad she to, did it that makes me I'm glad to hear but that then she did it good anyway. oh she did it anyway. <laughs> okay because then it turns out to be this amazing well, that's moment what I was in, say. The, in the film I was going to say at some point I'm guessing I'm, something like that may happen because yes. you're in the moment and yeah. you're going to be like 
no, I'm not going to not take it. But and yeah. again, and and we all sort of when we're in the field, we we do sort of weigh those risks ourselves mm -hmm. a little bit. And there, you know, you're not calling back to the studio in New York to say, oh, guess what? Yeah. You know, I mean, so I have, our correspondents though are fearless. I mean, they would do I would anything. Agree. I would you know? agree. I remember when I came to interview for my job, the executive producer at the time was like having some conversation, and I had the same. Um, preconceived notions about Vice too, coming from NBC, um, that I was very sort of like, am I coming into this environment? Mm -hmm. Where is this? Uh, I don't know what's going on here. Um, and he was sort of negotiating a shark dive with, for one of the correspondents, and was like, you know, we don't need the cages; they'll be fine. Oh and my God! I don't think that shoot ever ended up happening, but I, I, like, I don't think what so. What is but happening? And so, what was your your? Well, certainly with. Uh, I would say on a weekly basis, I'm speaking with our lawyers and with uh, assessments for security, and there's all sorts of things that are considered. Are you going into an area? Um, and obviously, I mean, HBO is extremely, extremely concerned about the safety of mm -hmm. the correspondents, and we talk about the and the producers and the camera people and the fixers and all the sound people, everyone that's involved. Um, uh, but for example, you know, is this person going into an area? Where having you know an armed guard with a flak jacket is that going to draw more attention? Is it not? Is right. this kind of, those right. are the kinds of things that get considered on a regional basis. Like for example, right now in in parts of Nigeria, you would not want to stand out. You would want to mix with the local population. That would be the easier way to go. That would be right. much safer as opposed to say you're going to Mosul and all bets are off, and then you have to obviously you may well be embedded with a military group. But the, uh, you know. All journalism of, of of the kind of quality that you're going to have, particularly with uh, war war uh, reporting, and remind us that we're now in, at war with Afghanistan in Afghanistan for 15 years. I know, and very few people seem to be talking about it. Um, I would say it's a, an opportunity uh, for Vice, certainly, and, and in fact, it's going to be coming up later in this season. Um, that's important to talk about. Many many people have died, millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars, billions perhaps. Um, and um, all of this is, uh, is still ongoing with no real resolution. I think it's important for people to have some understanding of what that situation is. So who's going to do that? Reporters are going to do that. Right. You know, and reporters, you know, and, and again, this is not to make light of it, but the kind of person often who will end up in a war zone, it's like, if you don't like the ocean, don't join the Navy. It's yeah. like, this mm -hmm. is a dangerous job. Um, and in fact, w many of the war correspondents that I know, they, that they're wired for this, Too, but, so, um, yeah. and people, you know, people have gotten uh, hurt um, all over the place uh, right. with other news organizations well, covering this, and, and mm -hmm. for sure, yeah. yeah. And in fact, I mean, we were talking about this earlier today. A uh, person I worked with and a person I went to school with, uh, both captured by the Taliban and eventually released. Like this happens, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. So these yeah. are, you know, these are these are real consequences. Um, so obviously, it's weighed very seriously, and we've had conversations from time to time. Are we sure about this? And right. mm -hmm. you know, there's a talk back and forth, and I'm not sure always what the decisions are, but I know that um, you know it's certainly not. Um, there's a you know there's a there's a hole. Go down in that hole and see what happens because right. it'll make for good TV. That is yeah. definitely not. I, I mean, that's yeah, definitely not that not you were implying. But, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> but but I, that's why I wanted you to make that distinction. In fact, White Helmets that yeah. won the documentary mm -hmm. yeah. short mm -hmm. at the Academy Awards. I saw an interview with those filmmakers. Not to shift away from Vice for a minute. I hope mm -hmm. you don't mind, but. And they um, were told by the White Helmets, don't come here. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're going to have to figure out a different way to film this because if you come here, you're going to make it worse for all of us. Mm -hmm. And so they, what they did is they trained people who were part of the White Helmets to do the cinematography. So they figured a way around that. Mm -hmm. So, And I, I would assume that that's the same thing. It's like, yes, you're wired for this sort of, I have, I'm going to go in, I want to mm -hmm. get this story. But you also know where those, when that line is drawn and you're going to respect that line. Yeah. Yeah. As best you can. Yeah, and I think the more that people do it, the more sort of calibrated and refined that sensibility gets in the field, and they make decisions that are mm -hmm. increasingly uh, based on prior experience. Right. So, but again, it's a, it's dangerous. Like it there's is, yeah, real yeah. risk there, and for sure. Um, I'm also struck by the people that are actually living in it. Like we think yeah. about the reporters going into it, and I'm, I, I often think about th there are the people that are actually living in this yeah. situation. So mm -hmm. that's just another piece. Yeah. Uh, can I just say one yeah. thing? Yeah. Um, we're going to actually start taking questions. So um, there's a microphone in the back. I have to make this announcement. That's why I interrupt. But um, so if you're interested in asking a question, please walk around to the microphone in the back, um, and JP and Beverly will answer your questions. 
I know we also have Paula in the audience, but I didn't see her. But if there's a question specifically about the editing of this piece, Paula, we might call on you to answer that as well. So if you have a question, feel free to get up and move toward the microphone, and we'll continue to talk a little bit. But um, JP, what were you going to say? Um, there's a number of excellent uh, correspondents who cover conflict for vice. Um, Seb Walker does incredible work. Uh, he comes from Al Jazeera uh, previously. And Ben Anderson is a, a esteemed reporter. I remember having a conversation with him recently, and he was talking about the fact that he, um, when he goes into a, uh, an unsafe situation, he won't wear a helmet of protective gear if the people he's with don't. And the reason that he does it, as he said to me, was because he didn't want um, to, to put himself in a position where he was reflecting the idea that his life was somehow more valuable than the people that he was with in order to get the story. That's the kind of people that are working on these stories advice. It's a very powerful, decent uh, way to, way to, uh, to, it's a very honorable way to, to, uh, to conduct your business. And I would say I sense that from Gianna in this piece as well, that she didn't see herself in anything other than as, as one a part of this piece that she was telling the story. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. She didn't mm -hmm. separate, I mean, I think it, it, it doesn't only hold for dangerous situations, it mm -hmm. holds for any situation, yeah. where you decide you're, to place yourself in the story. Yeah. And I felt like she put herself in this very um, on par with everyone that she was speaking with. And that's a version yeah. of, I think, what you're those describing. Are, you know, those guys are cool. It's a connection. They're yeah, cool yeah. People, right? it's amazing. The people that, that she they... was speaking with? Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I really have to say, yeah. you know, Incredible, yeah. yeah. Inc incredible children, incredible yeah. parents. Just very, mm. very impressed. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I would totally agree. So we do have a question over there. Now I have to be like an MC or something. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I was wondering, uh, regarding the H, the HBO Vice uh, uh, s specific documentary pieces, where where do those stories come from? You know, where That's where do they uh, uh, are they are they brought to people? Do you ever have outside people come to Vice with a story, or is it all Vice people? Oh, no. um, a lot of times, the producers will pitch the stories. We have um, a head of development who's now a supervising producer, and he sort of is the first, you know, stop for all pitches. Um, we do occasionally get pitches from outside. Um, sometimes we have freelance producers who have pitched stories that have been wonderful. Um, a lot of stories come from Shane Smith uh, directly, and he wants to do a story on a specific topic, and you know we sort of figure it out and uh, get to the nut of what he wants. Um, but yeah, it's mostly kind of internal pitches. JP mm. has come up with a couple pitches. Mm. You you have ideas now? Do you have ideas? You have ideas <laughs> every now and then. Once I've heard some ideas <laughs> float by on the phone. Um, yeah, so they they sort of come from all uh, all parts. We had we used to do this pitch process, which we don't really do anymore. But um, we would go through a pitch pack where everybody on the show, including you know down to interns, would pitch stories and see what we could mine out of them. But we are always looking. You know, no good idea will you know get. So I guess not what we're saying. What, what's your idea? Yeah, yeah. I was going to say <laughs> pitch us some stories. <laughs> we'll talk after. Thank you. <laughs> Pitching's fun. I mean, coming up with story ideas, oh. that's the best, because you, you don't have to you just well, think of it. It's, it's so uh, free. You I'm Gordon Quinn, who's part of Cartem Quinn Films, Gideon yeah. and I have both worked a lot with. He always says, yeah, the ideas, yeah. that's the easy part. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, you got to actually do it. Yeah, no, <laughs> yeah. totally. Ideas, that's, man, huh? Yeah, okay. you're right. So, <laughs> yeah. But it's, you're right, it is fun. To start fun. Hey, so um, I noticed that with the last character, Charlotte, I believe, you followed up with her after her surgery, and you could notice a um, a, a more self-confident woman. Yeah. yeah. I was wondering if you guys ever followed up with any of the younger uh, characters in the film and just saw how they were doing after they began treatment? Yeah, I mean, um, Nicole, uh, the producer, and Gianna both are in contact with all the characters in the film, and, um, you know, everybody is still, you know, pretty much status quo in how they're, you know, dealing with everything. Kai has been um, uh, in school, was, is not allowed to use the, the regular girls' bathroom still in her school. Um, it has been really hard. She's allowed to use the bathroom in the nurse's office. 
um, at the school. And uh, in a recent conversation they had, Kimberly told um, Gianna that uh, there have been times where that office has been locked and Kai hasn't been able to use the bathroom in there and has had accidents. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's really kind of a sad struggle yeah. uh, in that regard. But um, Max is doing really well. And, you know, Stevie is still hanging out in school. And everybody seems like they're still doing well. And, yeah, I'm glad that you noticed yeah. um, Charlotte and her newfound confidence. Uh, because it was kind of a remarkable transition for us looking at the raw footage sort of before and after her surgery. Yeah, we were literally talking about that in the car on the way to the hotel, uh, talking about it. So it's a very astute observation. Yeah. All right, thank you. Right. Do we have any other questions? Hi. Um, I was pleasantly surprised to hear that you guys were working with PFLAG and that they were helping you disseminate this piece for free because um, they have been criticized on certain occasions for not working with transgender youth mm -hmm. as much, being a little bit more old fashioned. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you came to them to ask? Uh, HBO has a long standing relationship with, with PFLAG and when I was putting together the call to action with with Vice to make sure that um, we could use this uh, documentary basically as a, as text for people to interpret how they how they like. Um, that was the organization that uh, floated to the top because we knew we could reach the largest number of people. Awesome. Yeah. Good to that's hear. A, Can you just tell us uh, what that organization is for those in the audience that don't know? Well, I mean, it's basically it's an organization that that it's an activist group that basically tries to act as a you know, disseminator of information, but also has community centers, and it's basically any kind of, um, you know, any kind of, um, any kind of uh, question um, that a person may have, they can go to that organization, and there's all kinds of uh, ways to uh, to use it to get in touch with other organizations that can help. It's basically a way to find your way. Oh, okay. Any so it's a large program. umbrella Correct. sort of situation. Okay. Yeah. Um, do you have on the actual HBO website, um, are there any resources there that link well, actually, to the piece? Thank you for asking. Yeah, you at, the, are at the at the end of the at the end of the um, of the the piece on HBO and then also uh, on the YouTube, um, there's a URL that will throw you to that organization. Oh, okay, so, good. So we, we it's that's a part of what we do um, with certain projects. We'll have messaging at the very end of the program if you want to know more go here and hopefully the person can take themselves on a, oh, know, good. take them in the direction that, they, that they'd like to go. Great. Yeah, it's a great, actually it's a great use of, uh, you know, obviously the first and foremost uh, from, from Beverly and the team is to make a beautiful film um, and they did that and the next step is like, okay, what can you do with that? Mm -hmm. Like it's been made as a, as a, as a work unto itself, now what, what can you do with it? And it's exciting to see it potentially have a positive effect for, you know, Hopefully, as many people as mm -hmm. you know as they can reach. Yeah. So we have another question. Yes. Hi. Um, I have two questions. <clears throat> the first question is: Do you have a follow-up of some of the stories that you've aired in prior uh, Vice seasons um, coming up? And then also, what is your vetting process for the stories that you actually put on your current season? How do you choose which stories actually make the grade and which don't? Yeah. Oh, um, that's a really good question. Uh, to answer your first question, we do have one story um, this season that Ben's working on that is a follow-up to some of the characters in a previous piece about uh, the Taliban that he did. Um, so that's something to look forward to. It's a really strong story that we're working on. Um, and then as far as what the vetting process is, um, we're trying really hard this season. Uh, it's not really, I guess, maybe it's a little bit of a criticism, but that some of our seasons in the past have been a little too depressing. Um, you know, people Who are sort that? of, well, you know, it's been a, it's been out there. The, oh, okay. You know, it's just like that the, um, <laughs> you know, the show the show has, it's, it can be kind of dark, mm. and um, a lot of people want some good news right now. So we're trying to have a much more eclectic season. I think where there's a lot of effort in making sure that the mix is uh, um, 
really different this season going forward. So we want to sort of have a little bit of everything. So there's a little bit of science, there's a little bit of tech, there's a little bit of, you know, these emotional stories. Um, there, there is going to be, you know, a handful of war stories. But we want to make sure that it's, you know, first the, the most important um, thing that we, is the stories have to be amazing and fantastic because we have this platform. Um, but then after that, we want to have a good mix sort of going forward. And, and there's good news out there? There's some good news out there. <laughs> well, there's definitely, there's, there are definitely things. We've got things. some funny pieces this season. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah. There's things that you can look at in the world that are like, hmm, I didn't know that, and I'm yeah. glad I did, you know? And I, I think there's a place for that, you know? I don't think it, not everything has to be, uh, you know, uh, brown rice all the time. Yeah, you know, I love true. I love brown rice, but, <laughs> that's but not point. for every meal. It's right. the eyebrow test. Yeah. Yeah. That's what our executive producer talks about. He's like, you know, if it gives him like the, oh, you right. know, the eyebrow face, then but, it's a good story. And I think you know <laughs> the the sort of basic sort of themes that get hit uh, for this season, uh, certainly uh, climate related mm -hmm. stories. Um, which I think Vice, frankly, and Vice News Tonight does an extraordinary job. If anyone's interested in, at all in issues of climate, the coverage that's taking place on that show right now is excellent. Um, but certainly climate stories, um, stories that have to do with human rights and civil rights, um, uh, certainly stories of science and technology, um, those are all like main main issues that you'll see over, mm -hmm. over and over. And Vice obviously has a reputation for engaging in stories that have to do with conflict and that still will go on but there's definitely a much it's it's a large number of shows there's a 29 I know it's an amazing it's, it's yeah. crazy it's an amazing actually. array it's yeah. a lot of it's let me just text did you have any were, yeah. did you get your questions answered there sir Yes, I did. Okay. I was just standing here. No, you're welcome to stand there, but I just didn't want you to feel like, oh, no, I had another question. More. <laughs> okay. Um, do we have any more questions over there? I think we have time for one more question. Um, is there some? Oh, good. Hi. Hi. So, um, as far as the characters and all of your stories go, um, is there a line that you guys find between keeping the connections between the reporters and producers? Like keeping the connections between the like those people and the characters uh, professional and personal. Does hmm. that make sense? Hmm, that's a good question. Like stay in touch, maybe. Like, or? do you mean in terms of um, uh, like keeping in touch with them afterwards, or? Um, I guess throughout just the whole process in general. Uh, also, with regards to keeping in touch with them. Yeah, afterwards. I mean, I think that the correspondents are really careful about not changing the story in any way. You know, they don't want to be so close that it will impact the story in any way whatsoever, but I think, you know, they do get very close to the characters that they're that they're talking to and meeting along the way and I think that's the way that they're able to get out these moments um, in the situations that they need to uh, bring to light. That's a great point to bring yeah. up. That that is a I mean you can speak to this mm -hmm. more but that is a fine line to walk between because these are human beings these are human connections mm -hmm. that you're making um, at the same time you can't be so in the story that it's all yeah. about the friendship because you might sort of step over that place that you're right you know missing that part that's the journalist or the filmmaker right mm -hmm. so but it's a tougher it's a tougher line I mean you can speak to this but I think mm -hmm. it's a tough line to walk because they're real people and these are real stories. Yeah. And so you can't help but be moved and engaged, and right? Yeah, I mean, I think that it's a kind of a natural, um, uh, it's a natural line that they seem to all n understand sort of intrinsically. I don't think that it's something that they're conscious of um, during the shoots that I'm aware it's of. It's part of the professionalism. Yeah, it's just part of how good they are at their are. jobs, yeah. yeah. No, I mean, it's interesting that I, I think there's a real talent to, to figure out how to be both present and non-obtrusive yeah. in those environments. And it's um, it's the sort of thing that oftentimes is, uh, um, you know, it, it's, uh, it just takes a fair amount of time or a certain kind of natural personality type to be able to negotiate that in a way that's, you know, um, respectful of people but getting what you need in order to tell a truthful story. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think we're just finishing up but I wanted to just ask you JP to yes. just 
um, you know, for those of us that um, can't afford HBO, mm -hmm. um, how do we get to see this? You mentioned it earlier, but I wanted you to mention sure. it again. Uh, and also, you know, the nightly news pieces. Just if you can talk a little bit about how we can get access to these. Yeah, stories. I would. I would say you could dine out on typing in <laughs> Vice and YouTube and HBO, and you will find a lot of material uh, for free. Uh, that um, will keep you informed. And virtually every day, uh, we have one piece, uh, or two to three times a week, we have pieces coming out from Vice News Tonight uh, that are, I, I think, consistently excellent. And then during the season, we'll have potentially more uh, uh, cases where something like trans youth will be released for some limited period of time so people can see it. And truthfully, you know, we do it because we are really proud of it. Uh, we're really proud of what the work stands for. We think it's important, and we want people to have access to it, regardless of you know whether or not it's like plays into our business model. And right. to work at a place where people <laughs> think that way is, I dare say, beautiful and mm -hmm. rare because it's not every day right. uh, where. And and I have to say, and I, it's not just because I, I work there. I'm so impressed with the way that HBO treats artists and creative people. Um, I really haven't seen anything like it. It's uh, as long as the, um, you know, as long as the, um, once that that relationship is established, like once HBO says, we love what you're doing, we'll do everything that we can mm -hmm. to support that work. And That's it's fantastic. I know. That is really fantastic. <laughs> and on that note, I just want to say thank you so much thank to you. both thank of you, you for coming to Duval, bringing this piece, thank and you. speaking afterwards. Yes.